And uh, I do. Who remembers? Uh, who, give me a wave if you've uh, heard me speak before. Yeah, a lot of people. It's great to be back again. For those that remember my story of Barbie, anybody remember that? Yeah, Barbie is in the house right now. And uh, her real name is Jackie. And uh, she's so incredible. And can we give her a big round of applause? So good to have her with me. We've been married uh, almost 18 years. And uh, God has been good. And uh, thank you so much. I can, uh, I'm good for a little bit. But uh, I, I'm ex- so excited about this word. I, I feel like it's a real word for today that's going to minister to people. But, um, you know, the last few months we have seen incredible momentum. Uh, we've seen pe- more people get free in the last probably two, three months than I've actually seen in the last few years. You know, we've been seeing people get free of anxiety, depression, addictions, uh, hurts, and, and just so many different things. It's just been such an incredible month. God's really just graced us to, to help people step into freedom. And, and one of the things that, that I'm actually so excited about is we actually launched uh, just about a month or two ago, and this is a big part of seeing a, a greater level of freedom. We, we launched our ministry, which is called A Freedom Experience. Everyone say, A Freedom Experience. There you go, afreedomexperience.com is our website, but we actually have a a 21-day online freedom experience, and it's a journey that people do online for 21 days, and and it's about mind renewal, it's about God encounter, it's about seeing things shifted that you couldn't see by yourself, but God literally intervenes in bedrooms and living rooms, and you know, we had one lady start who was having major anxiety, panic attacks, and insomnia, She's now finished the online freedom experience. She has no panic attacks, no anxiety, and no more insomnia. And and so, because we just believe in the power of God and freedom. And and so if there's an area, and even if it's just a destructive mindset, maybe low self-worth, maybe an addictive uh, mindset, maybe a sort of a condemning or fear, whatever it might be, uh, we'd love to invite you to do that. Uh, It's $47 for the month. And, uh, you know, to be able to go through the thing. If you, if you sign up today, you get 15% off. So Jackie's going to be at the table just down here when you walk on the right. And I'll probably be out there as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've shared my story of drug addiction. And, and uh, I ended up being a drug addict for 10 years of my life. I was mentally ill. The television was speaking to me. The radio was speaking to me. I was suicidal. I almost took my life at 19 years old. But I had an auntie that prayed for 17 years, and through her prayers, I radically got born again. And Jesus set me free of my addiction, set me free of mental illness. Come on, He can do anything. There's no problem too big for God. And, but God revealed to me the, the, the key factor that actually led me to a path of addiction. And of course, there were many factors. My parents role modeled drug addiction, so that, of course, didn't help. And I was also drawn to the wrong friendship groups, and that didn't help either. And then, of course, there were the decisions that I made that I was responsible for. But God showed me once I became a Christian, the key factor in me ending up becoming a drug addict is that when I was five years old, my mum and dad divorced. And I want to tell you right now, if you've been through a divorce, I want to tell you that God is a God of second chances, God of third chances, and He's a God of redemption and restoring and and, 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 you know, no one is ever too far gone for God. He can always bring good into your life. And, but the reality is divorce hurts, and especially children. And, and so when my mom and dad divorced, as that little boy, I felt like my dad's love had been taken away from me. And, and so without, this is what God revealed to me once I became a Christian, it is that once I became a Christian, see, I have this incredible encounter with the love of the Father. My addictions were broken in a moment. But, but, but see, when I was on that journey of that five-year-old little boy, I felt like my dad's love had been taken away from me. And I set off on a quest to try and get back his love. And subconsciously as a little boy, I looked at what my dad valued, and he valued sleeping around. He, he valued taking drugs, excessive alcohol, being the person at the party that would make everybody laugh. And as a little boy growing up, I thought to myself, if I can get really good at all of those things, then maybe I'll get my dad's love back. But you know the story, it didn't get me his love back, but instead caused me to become what society would call a junkie that was mentally ill, that had nothing to offer society. And well, society society saw me as a mentally ill junkie. God the Father saw me as a little boy that was just on a quest to try and get back his earthly dad's love. And, you know, I told you the story where I radically encountered the love of the Father. My addictions are broken in a moment. 
But that junk that was connected to my dad, I brought into my relationship with God. And I had this sense that if I don't do all the things that God loves, I wonder how long it'll be before he also leaves just like my dad did. And so I would try and be super Christian in the church. I, I had to read my Bible every day. I, I had to fast, you know, in certain times and try and tell someone about Jesus every day. And whatever area there was in the church, I was serving in every single one of them. I'd even turn up to the women's meetings. I was messed up. <clears throat> and there's nothing wrong with serving and reading your Bible and fasting and telling people about Jesus. They're all good things. But if you're doing them out of a place to try and earn something that is already a free gift from heaven, then that's a destructive thing. Yeah. And I would normally last about three months of trying to be super Christian. And I'd end up at an altar where I'd feel so burdened and heavy laden and, 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 and so heavy. And, and I'd end up at an altar and I'd feel His love again. And tears would stream down my face. And this went on for a good couple years, every three months. And tears would stream down my face and he'd say, Lucas, I'm your father. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Lucas, if you were to sit on the beach and do nothing for me for the next three months, it doesn't change the fact that you're my son and I'm your father and I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. So you could say that those first few years I was radically found, but at the same time I was lost lost in religion. And that's what I wanna talk about this message today, it's called Lost in Religion. And it comes from a parable that's very famous in Luke 15. And many will know the story, and in my Bible, the title of this story, it's titled The Lost Son, which I actually believe is an incorrect title. See, in the Bible, the, 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 the titles of each section, the chapters and the verses were only instituted in the 1600s by publishers. I'm thankful that they were put there because it makes it easier to preach. Because who knows, we might be here a long time if I say, hey, turn to that part of the book where it talks about such and such. We could be flicking for quite a while. So I'm thankful for the titles, the verses, the chapters, but in this moment, I feel like they got it wrong. I'll show you why in a moment. But the very famous part of the story, I'm gonna do in my own words and we'll read it's part of the text that we don't talk about as much. Remember the start of the story where the younger brother, he says to dad, hey dad, I've had enough. Give me my inheritance because I'm going to go do my own thing. This younger brother, he goes to a distant country where he squanders his money in wild living, in prostitution, in, in getting drunk, in partying. Eventually, an incredible famine comes. Just as a side note, can I tell you for a second, sometimes a famine is not from the devil, but it's actually the grace of God. Because sometimes a famine is the vehicle that God is sending to take you back to where you need to be. See, thank God for the famine, because the young boy never would have went home if it wasn't for the famine. The famine was a thing that took him back to where he needed to be. But he comes to his senses, he's feeding pigs, and for a Jewish person, that is an abomination. He's so destitute, so broke, that he desires to eat the pig food. And then he comes to his senses and he thinks, man, even the servants in my father's house, they're being treated better than this. And he says, I'll go home and I'll just say, dad, just let me be a servant, no longer a son. And I love this. He's on his way home and he's walking. And the Bible says that while he was a long way off, the father saw him. You know what that tells me? See, you only ever see someone that's a long way off if you are actually looking for that particular person. You don't accidentally see someone half a mile down the road. You only see someone half a mile down the road if you are looking for that particular person. And it paints a picture of a father that probably every day stood at that same spot thinking, I hope today is the day that my son returns. And here comes the son with the pig muck all over him, the stench of the sinful life that he's been living for maybe the last couple years. With his head down full of shame, covered in pig muck, and the Bible says the father runs toward him. But when he gets to him, he doesn't get to him and say, hey son, <coughs> clean yourself up and then we'll embrace. But with the stench of the pig muck and the sinful life he'd been living, the father grabs him and pulls him tight. He puts his lips on his neck 
See, I want to tell you right now, God is not messed up by your mess. God's not freaking out because you've got some mess happening. God's not freaking out about that secret sin that nobody else knows about. But then I love the first thing he does to the son is he says, now to the servants, get the best robe and put it on him. That robe is a picture of the robe of righteousness. The reason he put the robe of righteousness on him was not because God was freaked out by his mess, but to cover the mess so that nobody else could see it. Because love covers a multitude of sin. He wanted to cover his boy so that nobody else would put shame upon him. He put the ring on his finger which spoke of authority. He put sandals on his feet which speaks of destiny. You know, as Christians, we're sometimes good at believing God gives second chances. But we have this religious mindset where we believe he gives second chances, but now we have to take second place. See, God's so good that he does second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth chances, but he still allows you to finish in first place. He celebrates and they kill a fattened calf and they celebrate because his son was lost. And then we find ourselves in Luke chapter 15, the second part of the story. That's not so popular in verse 25. It says, meanwhile, the older brother, the older son was in the, yeah, that was it? No, okay. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field when he came to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the service and he said, what was going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry. So he just stopped there for a moment and he refused to go in. Who knows that this shouldn't be called the parable of the lost son. It should be called the parable of the two lost sons. Because who knows that when you're angry about someone coming back to faith, you might be a little bit more lost than the person that just walked in and got found. He became angry, but his father pleaded with him, come into the party, son. Next slide. But he answered the father, look, Look how long I've been serving at Relevant Church. I've been on the kids team. I've done uh, ushers. I've done pack down. I've done set up. I've been tithing the whole time. I go to two services on a Sunday. I'm paraphrasing just in case you're wondering. (laughs) And in paraphrasing form, he says, where's my party? In other words, he was lost in religion. Look at all that I've done. Where's my party? Next slide. But this son, when he squanders your property with prostitutes, he comes home, you kill the fattened calf. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. And it goes on to say, but we had to celebrate because this son was dead, but now he is alive. See, remember I said there was no chapters, no titles, no verses. When Jesus told this parable, he actually told three parables, but they're all one. He told a parable about a sheep. Remember that? And he talked about a shepherd who represents God. And a shepherd had a hundred sheep, but one of those sheep decided to leave. And that one sheep left the safety and comfort, remember, of the pen. And because he left the comfort and safety of the pen, he got caught up in the thickets. And the shepherd had to go and untangle him and bring him back into the safety of the pen. No chapters, no verses, no titles, go to the next one. Then Jesus says there was a woman who also represents God. She had 10 coins. She happened to lose one of those coins inside of the house. But what she did was she switched on the light. She grabbed her broom. She swept the entire house until she found the coin that was lost. No chapters, no verses, no titles, straight into the next story. Jesus says there was a man, a father who represents God. He had two sons. The youngest son, let's just say he was a sheep that decided to leave the house. And because he left the house, he got caught up in the thickets of life and the shepherd had to go and rescue him and bring him back into the comfort and safety of the house. But at the same time, there was a younger brother that was a sheep. There was an older brother who was a coin. He was in the house, but he was just as lost as the brother that had left the house. Because you can be lost in the world, but you can be lost in the house. And I would even put to you that it might be more dangerous than to be lost in the house in religion than it is to be lost in the world. Let me explain. When the younger brother, excuse me for being graphic, but while he was sleeping with prostitutes, 
There wasn't a moment that he was waking up saying, I wonder if I'm lost. And at least if you know that you're lost, you also know that you eventually need to be found again. But when you're lost in the house, and what I mean by that, it's not becoming about relationship and it's all just about religion. Somewhere you lost relationship and now it's tick a box off. Church did that, did that, did that. When it becomes about religion, you can be lost and not even know that you're lost. And this older brother was lost in religion. You know, the whole agenda of the enemy with a religious spirit or a religious mindset, the whole agenda is to distort the way that you see the Father. See, think about it. Jesus painted us such a beautiful picture of who the Father was. A a father that ran to a son that had messed up. A father that put a robe on him so that no one would see his shame. A father that went out to the older son, even though he had a bad attitude, and he pleaded with him, son, come into the party. But it's very clear to see this older brother, he didn't see that picture of the father. Somewhere along the road, the the, the, the image that the older brother saw of the father had become distorted, and he saw a completely different image of who the father was. See, two things that happen when you... See, when you get caught up in religion, a religious mindset or a religious spirit, two things. Number one, you'll see God as a taskmaster instead of a rewarder. And because we're in America, I'm going to say taskmaster, okay, just because I'm a little bilingual. (laughs) Un poquito. But, but, But when religion will cause you to see him as a taskmaster instead of a rewarder, which is a lie from the enemy. See, think about this. If you know someone that's a taskmaster, you don't want to spend time with them. Because if you get around a taskmaster, by definition, there's someone that requires a whole lot from you, but hardly gives anything in return. There's a lot of people that that's how you see God. Someone that requires a whole lot. He's got a whole bunch of rules and regulations, but he doesn't really give much in return. You know how marriages break down when there's one party or both that really are are requiring a whole lot but not giving much in return? See, any relationship will come to ruin when it's that kind of relationship. And the enemy wants you to see God as a taskmaster that requires a whole lot but doesn't give much in return. We won't go there, but verse 29 was where I paraphrased and. The older brother, he says, look at look what I've done. And, and he ends with, where's my party? And then the father in verse 31, he says, son, you're always with me. And everything I have is yours. See, I want you to catch this, right? Because geographically, he was with him. But I would put to you that he wasn't really with him. Just like you could be in this service today and we had incredible worship and you were here, but maybe you weren't really here. You can be sitting under the living Word of God right now and you can be here, but you might not really be here. And, and, and what he was with him, but I would put to you that he wasn't really with him. Because the father said this, he says, son, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. I want you to catch this because a religious spirit will stop you from wanting to be with him. And the more that you're with him, the more that your eyes will be open to the fact that everything he has is actually mine. The more that I'm with him, you know what? Uh, Peace instead of anxiety, that's mine. Joy instead of depression, I'm gonna have some of that too. Prosperity instead of lack, I'm gonna have that too. A marriage that everybody else wants because it's so amazing, I'm going to have that too. Children that are on fire for Jesus, I'm going to have some of that as well. See, that's why the enemy wants you to get into religion instead of relationship. Because religion will stop you from seeing that everything he has, it's actually already mine. See, it's a lie from the enemy that that, that, that God is a taskmaster. He's actually the total opposite. He's a rewarder. He loves to reward. He looks forward to rewarding. 
So much so that probably one of his strongest principles of the entire Bible in every single book of the Bible is a principle called sowing and reaping. I remember maybe 15 years ago, God rocked my world with this principle of sowing and reaping that God never speaks about seed time without also mentioning harvest time in the same sentence. He never speaks about sowing without mentioning reaping in the same sentence. He never speaks about giving without mentioning receiving in the same sentence. Because it's his principle that he put into place. I hope I don't upset anyone today. But I personally don't like the saying, and I don't want to preface this because I've said it many times and I understand the truth that's in the statement that I'm about to say, but I want to explain why I personally don't like it. When people say don't give to get, I actually don't like that. Now I understand why we say it because it shouldn't be a selfish thing, it should be motivated by love. But I believe that that statement does more harm than it does good. Because you should never give without attaching faith to the thing that you sowed in the kingdom of God. And sometimes that statement makes people feel bad about actually believing to receive something because of what they've sown. Now, just in case you're getting religious on me, God gave to get. John 3, 16. God so loved the world. So yes, he was motivated by love. But God so loved the world that he what? He gave his one and only son so that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but instead would have eternal life. God didn't sow his best seed in Jesus and think to himself, well, if I get something, I get something. I don't really care. I'm not gonna expect something. God gave Jesus expecting that every time the gospel is preached, that there'd be another son, another daughter in every city, in every country, in every nation all over the world. God's in heaven saying, I'm so glad I sowed that seed. <clears throat> you know, a little while ago when we, we moved here three years ago and, and I, the word God gave me is that we would take two steps back to go five steps forward. So our first couple years, I've got to be honest, they were tough. We went from a, a big, beautiful house to a small two-bedroom apartment. We had two cars, we went to one. Our income went from this down to this. Thankfully, we're starting to get ready to cross into the steps forward. But we're, last June, we're on our way back. We went to vacation back in Australia for four weeks to see our family. And we had this couple, they rang us and they they said, when you get to LA, we don't want you to go home. We want you to come straight to our house. And if I be honest with you, we were a little bit annoyed because it's a 20-hour trip already. And they live 20 minutes past my house. So they were adding 40 minutes to my 20-hour trip. <laughs> but they were insistent, this beautiful Malaysian couple. We get to their house. They had organized someone to pick us up at LA. We're parked at the front of the house. I'm thinking, what in the world are we doing here? I haven't even been home yet. And then all of a sudden, both of them start crying. And they press the button on their, on their garage and the door starts to open and there's this car and it's a 2016 Toyota eight-seater Highlander. They went and paid with their own money $32,000 and they're crying and they said, Connells, we want you to know that this is now your second car. We drove away from that house in a better family car than they had for themselves. We went home, I was laying on my bed, jet lagged. I wake up after an hour, I look across on my wife's side of the bed, she has this wall with different prayers and scriptures and pictures of things she's believing for and I look and I see a white car. I walk over to the bed and I investigate the car that she's had up there for the past year. It is the exact same car that is now sitting in our garage and it's been on her wall. She's believing for it for the past year. But see, here's the thing. There's always a backstory to the story. Two, three months before June, I started asking God, I'm in a church that is a church of faith like this one that's believe, you know, uh, pushing me to believe for more. I start believing, God, I'm going to believe for a $10,000 blessing. Somehow I'm just going to see $10,000 in one go, I'm going to get blessed. And I pray, I say, God, I'm believing for a $10,000 blessing. And then the Holy Spirit speaks to me and He says, but you've never sown in tens. He says, you've sown lots in ones of thousands and you've reaped lots in ones of thousands. I said, get behind me, Satan. 
I'm just trying to ask for $10,000 here. Don't you hate when God flips it around? You ask Him for something, He's like, yeah, cool. Well, there's something you've got to do. And I promise you for two, three months, I'm, I'm, every time, I'm, I'm a man, so I'm a little stubborn. So I keep praying. God, I thank you for $10,000. And again, that little thing, go, but you've never sown in tents. If you sow in tents, you'll reap in tents. And after about two, three months, our church, once a year, we do a, a big kind of vision builders offering so we can buy more buildings so that more people get saved and help missions and all this kind of stuff. And just before we were about to hop on the plane to come back to America, back in June, before we got the car, my wife and I were chatting. We said, next Sunday is the day we've got to commit to a certain amount of vision builders. I finally said to her, I said, for three months, I felt this annoying thing that if we sow in tens of thousands, we'll reap in tens. She's a woman of faith. I've got to be real with you. It cost us about $70,000 to move from Australia of our own money. That was down to our last 10,000 that we had. She's a woman of faith that said, I believe we should sow it. Before we had even got to the church to sow the money, there was already a car waiting for us in someone else's garage worth $32,000. Let me tell you this, because it's all connected. It is, it is, just in case you're getting religious on me. I know the Bible says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. But understand the context. Jesus is speaking to Pharisees that are saying, look at how good I am. I can stand a hand on my heart. I'm not doing that. I'm trying to encourage you in the one area where God says, test me. Do you know what test me means in today's language? I double dare you. Three months after we get given that car and it's collect, connected to the seed, we get the idea for a freedom experience that is already helping so many people get free, but I believe it will be a blessing to us. I have a businessman that hears about our idea. We wanna start this platform, course, website. We need money to make that happen. He rings me up and he says, hey, I wanna give you $30,000 to make that thing happen. But then he texts me and he says, listen, he doesn't know what I've just told you. He says, there's just one problem. I can't give you 30,000 now. Is it okay if I give you 10,000 now, 10,000 next month, and could I give you 10,000 the month after? I think we're reaping in tens. See, I just wanna break some stuff in this place because listen to me, a religious spirit is okay with you giving, but not okay with you tapping into giving and receiving. See, when someone keeps giving and giving and giving and never receives, you'll eventually grow tired. But if you'll tap into the fact that your father is a rewarder, he's looking for opportunities to bless, that when you give, you'll attach faith. If I'm gonna tithe, God's gonna look after everything that I've got. When I sow a seed, God's gonna look after See, think about this. If I was to throw a tennis ball in the air right now, what would I do once I throw it? I would now, I would now stand like this. Why? Because I understand the law of gravity that tells me the ball's coming down. I better get ready to catch it. But when you understand that God is a rewarder and He instituted a principle called sowing and reaping, then every time you sow, it's not selfishness, but every time you sow, you're now standing ready. I'm believing for opportunity. I'm believing for God to bless my business. I'm believing for a creative idea that's gonna bring finance into our house. See, religion wants you to see Him as a taskmaster instead of a rewarder, which is a life from the pit of hell. The second thing, just if the keyboarder could come, this is just a quick point. <clears throat> Let me just touch on stuff. I hope I don't hurt you, but maybe we should. And when I say this, I'm gonna say something right now that might hurt a little, but I'm saying it in a fact that I've done this very thing many, many times. You know one of the keys of how you know when you're stuck in religion is when you get upset about someone else's blessing. I've done it. When one of my friends got blessed, and instead of just being happy, the initial thing was, well, where's my car? Look at all I've done. Now I'm the older brother. See, but when you're in relationship, being with him, seeing that everything you have is, everything he has is yours, and you see someone else blessed, then you're just excited because you're like, yep, there it is again. He's a rewarder. He loves to bless. And if he's blessing you, it'll just be a matter of time before he blesses me too. But the last thing is this. The last thing, and this is such a big one, that, that happens when we see him through a religious mindset or a spirit of religion whatever you want to call it, 
is a religious spirit, a religious mindset will distort you into seeing that God is a judge instead of a dad. See, see, think about this. A judge determines your worth based on your actions. That's a judge's job. A judge is to look at what has or has not been done and then make a decision. Make a determination of the rest of that person's life. A, a dad determines worth purely based on whose you are. My two boys are the most valuable boys on the planet to me. And it's not anything to do with what they have or haven't done. It's everything to do with whose they are. I, I was praying for this young guy and when I pray for people and a lot of times see freedom, I often get pictures in my spirit. But if I get real with you for a moment, the pictures that I often see they're special to the person, but I've normally seen that same picture like a hundred times. You wanna know why? Because we all have the same problems. We're just all pretending that none of us have the problem that everyone else in the same room has the same problem as us. Listen, you, your face can't get healed if you won't take off your mask. And I remember I was praying for this young guy, worship leader, he loved God so much but he was falling down in an area sexually. So I don't know why I keep doing it, Lucas. And I prayed for him and I saw this picture I've never ever seen before. And it was a picture of this little being and I, re I knew it represented something demonic, a demon. And, 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 but that wasn't what the focus of the, what I saw in my spirit, it was just this little being. But what it was doing is it was holding up a measuring stick. And as soon as I saw in my spirit, I knew it was a religious spirit. See, because you know what a religious spirit does? Is it constantly on the inside of you, it wants to hold up a spiritual measuring stick. But when a spiritual measuring stick is being held up, you know what, there's only two ways that you can go with that and they're both bad. One is, yeah, better than most of the people at Relevant. They don't tithe, I do. They're not as committed as us. They don't serve, I do. Now you're in pride. But you wanna know where most of us go when the spiritual message stick is held up? Yeah. Yeah, I fail. I shouldn't have looked at that stuff. I shouldn't have gossiped about that person. In reality, I should have been a better husband. I should have been a better dad. I should have been a better Christian. I should have been a better friend. And that's where most of us go. But I wanna tell you right now, there is only one spiritual measuring stick that matters and it's the cross of Jesus Christ. And every time you look to that spiritual measuring stick, it screams back at you no matter what you've done, that you are holy, blameless, worthy, a child of the most high God. <clears throat> Just two stories and then we're gonna wrap it up. I remember... It was a while back and I've, I've struggled a lot with condemnation. Come from a broken home, very lower socioeconomic. And I was actually fasting. I did a three day fast, I was praying and fasting for three days, no food. And I was on day two of my fast and I was walking down the street and I was praying. And then all of a sudden this thought of some mistakes that I've made, just a few months back, I get bombarded with these mistakes. And they come into my mind and then I start to entertain and think about them, man, I shouldn't have done that. And, and, and now as I meditate on these mistakes, now I'm sort of walking like this. And then as I, about, after about three, four minutes of now feeling really discouraged, it was like I come to my senses and I thought to myself, hang on a minute, I'm fasting. Like that is the most spiritual thing you can do in the whole Bible. There's nowhere to go from that. Like fasting, that's the big one. And it was like I came to my senses. I thought, here I am doing the most spiritual thing you can do and I still feel not good enough. And it was like I had discernment, you stinking, dirty, religious spirit that's trying to hold up a measuring stick over my life. My only measuring stick is Jesus on the cross, crucified for that sin, that mistake, those areas where I fell short. 
Last story. I remember I was preaching at a, a youth conference, a big church in, in, in England, and there's about 2,000 teenagers. And this particular day, I spoke about the love of the Father. And it was one of those moments, mo- moments where the love of the Father felt so strong that of the couple thousand, well, there was actually a thousand kids because the conference was over two, three day kind of thing. So a thousand kids. And of the thousand kids, probably about 700 of them that were at the altar and they were literally weeping in an out of control way. All you could hear across the room was another one, and then another one, another one, another one. As they wept out loud, as they encountered the love of the Father. Then at the end of the service, there were volunteers that made the conference happen and they wore these yellow fluorescent vests. And This man came up to me and he was about 70 years old in a yellow fluorescent vest. And he came up to me and, and he was a blubbering mess. I could hardly understand him because he was a blubbering mess and because of his strong English accent. I felt a little bit, bit like what a lot of you are feeling right now. What did he say? <laughs> but he came up to me in his strong English accent and his blubbery mess, and he says, Lucas, he says, I've been in church my whole life. He said, today I realized he loves me just the way I am. We wept together, 70 year old man, 42 year old man. We hugged and we wept and It's a beautiful moment that I'll treasure for the rest of my life. But as much as it was a beautiful moment, it's also a terribly sad moment. It's like you've been in the house your whole life, but you were the coin that was lost, trying to be good enough, trying to do all the right stuff, never feeling like you were worthy, trying to earn something that had already been given to you as a free gift. I wanna pray for people in this place. In just a moment, I'm gonna ask a question. And If you're in this place and maybe you relate to the younger brother where you feel lost. Just like me, it was 19 years ago, I was lost. I, I was caught up in the thickets of life. I was caught up in some stuff that was robbing me of so much but I made a decision like the younger brother did to simply come home. But maybe you don't relate to the younger brother. Maybe you relate more to the older brother. And if you were to get real and honest, you'd say, Lucas, I've been in the house. And and, and let me tell you this, it's no fault of the church. It's just human nature. We live in a world that's all about do good, get good. And it's so easy to bring that into a relationship with God. But if you relate more to the older brother and say, Lucas, if I'd be honest with you, I relate to the older brother. I, I'm in the house, but I feel lost. Do you, do, you want, do you want me to just show you a little tip of how you know when you're lost in religion? See, the older brother wouldn't come into the party. You know that you're lost in religion when your relationship with Him has stopped being a party. Now, I'm not gonna preach a theology that says if you become a Christian, everything will be one big party, because that would be a lie. So I'm not talking about life, because there's seasons that are mountaintops and seasons that are valleys. But what I'm talking about, if your relationship with Him, if the life has gone out of it, if it has 100% stopped becoming a party, then maybe somewhere along the road, it became about religion, all the things you have to do instead of relationship, being with the one who matters.